Justice delayed is justice denied. This is a phrase embedded within the very being of every judicial system in the world, or at least it should be. Yet, the essence of this phrase is sometimes hard to live by. Sometimes comes before us a case so shocking yet so convoluted that not years but decades pass by without a shred of justice. Such is the case of a 21-year-old nun from Kerala, a woman whose brutal death in 1992 remained unsolved till December of 2020. This is the story of Sister Abhya. everyone welcome to desi crime a show where we dive deep into some of the craziest cases from around south asia i'm your host ashwara and i'm aryan and the case i have for you today is right out of a soap opera it has sex scandal religion drama death corruption and every other possible crazy true crime theme you can think of you know if i had to come up with a list of you know likelihood of people getting murdered mm-hmm. a 21 year old nun mm-hmm. would be the last person on that list let alone it taking 28 years for said nun to mm-hmm. get justice yeah no it goes like new one kids the lai lama and right there, there somewhere in that nun. group is a nun i agree and on for this case without any further ado i am going to take you to the year 1992 inside the hostel of the saint pius ex convent in kottayam kerala in this convent on the night of march 27th were living multiple catholic nuns one of whom was supposed to be 21 year old abhya who was born beena thomas A beautiful and bright young woman, Sister Abhya was known for her hard work and the dedication to her congregation she unflinchingly displayed. To be a nun at 21 isn't a small feat now and it wasn't back in the early 1990s either. In fact, it was her dedication and her hard work that prompted Abhya to wake up in the wee hours of the morning of March 27th at around 4 a.m. to study for her upcoming exams as a college student. But when the other nuns woke up hours later on the 27th they would find in their hostel kitchen an eerily somber scene but no sister abhya in the kitchen the fridge door was wide open with a bottle of water lying on the floor with the water spilt all over next to that water bottle was a single flip flop slipper the owner of which everyone knew was sister abhya but there seemed to be no sign of her Under the kitchen door was caught a white whale and the kitchen door had been locked from the outside but perhaps the most jarring detail of all was the small hand axe that also lay on the floor along with everything else when the nuns woke up to this scene in the kitchen they noticed instantly that the one person missing from among them was sister abhya in fact one of the nuns even recalls abhya waking up at around 4 am and walking towards the kitchen Looking at this scene everyone felt a bit in their stomach it was obvious something very bad had happened to one of their own and so the convent wasted no time in calling the police to the hostel as the police searched every room washroom and space and as the police walked along the exterior of the hostel building hoping for clues they stood dead in their tracks because they had found one the other slipper Ashwara, so this is a hostel where nuns live, right? Correct. Uh, I assume it's different from a college hostel. Absolutely. I don't know what a nun hostel looks like. Are they allowed to leave the hostel? Is it is it common for somebody to not be there, or is this so uncommon a sight that somebody is missing, you know, missing without permission, that everybody needs to be super worried? So the hostel was a space for a lot of nuns that were also adults. So I don't think it was quite like. 
a system of a college hostel mm. where you also had you know a warden who was making sure you were in and out and what times you were coming back yeah. i don't think it was quite that yet it was usual or unusual for some people to be gone and others to be there at 4 a.m mm. and i think that's what it was i think someone knew one of the nuns there knew that sister abhi was going to wake up at 4 a.m and study for the exams that she was preparing for mm -hmm. and then when they come into this scene in the kitchen where there's an axe on the floor there's water bottle spilled there's a fridge door that's wide yeah. open it's all just odd and really jarring and i know this would probably make no sense but a nun hostel is not going to have like parties like normal hostels do so no, this I couldn't be because of a 4am party no, no i don't that's think just so not the vibe there no. as they took small cautious steps towards the well Little did they know that what they were about to find would change the state of Kerala forever. Inside the well was Sister Rabia's lifeless dead body floating up at the top of the water. All right, Aran, now I'm going to read out to you Sister Rabia's post-mortem report results and I want your honest thoughts on hmm. them. Does it sound like an aggressive crime? Does it sound like probably not an aggressive crime? In fact, does it sound like a crime at all or not? Okay. Could it possibly be a suicide? The post-mortem report said the following. Sister Rabia had significant lacerations on her shoulders and her hips along with two lacerations to her head. There were also nail marks on either side of her neck. She had no signs of sexual assault. Considering this along with the scene that was found inside the kitchen with the slippers missing all over the place, the axe, the veil, what would you say? How did Sister Rabia in your mind right now die? I think a fight broke out between her and somebody else uh i guess nail marks uh, suggest another nun maybe because i know women tend to have longer nails but sure. you know nails could be from a man as well but seems like there was a fight that ensued for sure so there is no situation in your mind where this is not a crime uh, yeah i i would argue i would wager if i was a betting man there is a yeah. crime that's involved because why else would she have like nail marks on her own neck i agree and this aryan your reaction is the exact reaction of every sane person who has ever read the facts of this case okay i'm glad to know i'm sane i was like what well, about but that. there is a big but something really weird began to happen in this case from the moment that the post mortem was even conducted Right from the offset the authorities and the convent seemed hell bent on claiming that this was a suicide For example the police never let Dr Radha Krishnan the doctor who conducted the autopsy even visit the crime scene and you remember the nail marks found on either side of sister abhya's neck that was never revealed in the autopsy that is something the photographer taking photos of her body noticed and then pointed out to other people despite all of these discoveries though the autopsy labeled the cause of death to be drowning added to all of this was the reaction of sister abhya's own convent which just didn't seem to make sense to anyone the convent whenever it did speak to the police or to the public only seemed to suggest that sister abhya died either by suicide due to her deteriorating mental condition and severe depression or by accidentally slipping and falling into the well despite enlisting the laceration and the nail marks in the autopsy yeah. the same autopsy enlist the cause of death as drowning absolutely hmm it just gets we all know from here in fact shortly after her death the convent went on to heavily remodel their whole building trying to renovate it thereby completely changing the crime scene forever and the police seem to tag right along with this theory despite having seen all of the evidence For example the police never sent sister abhya's clothes for forensic examination and the inquest report that the police prepared never once mentioned the various injuries to her body that could not be explained by suicide not only did they not send multiple pieces of evidence for examination but they also ended up destroying multiple pieces of evidence shortly after the murder the medical report also had forged signatures on it completely invalidating it And this wasn't even the only document that turned out to be forged in this case. There were many more, including Sister Abhya's chemical examination reports. After all of this rather shady behavior on part of the Kerala police and the congregation to which Abhya belonged, her death was finally ruled a suicide by drowning just a few short weeks after her death. 
I will say if you had to fake, you know, stage a suicide, mm-hmm. drowning is probably the worst to use because who commits suicide by drowning by themselves, drowning. right? I agree. Uh, yeah. You know, poison is a good alibi to walk around with yeah. or maybe pushing somebody off of a building. Yeah. But I don't know. I don't think I've ever heard of a suicide by drowning. I, I do remember the couple other times I've heard of a suicide by drowning. There have been staged suicides. Interesting. Yeah. I feel like I have heard of suicides by drowning off of like bridges and stuff. But isn't it so much weirder to try and conceive a suicide by drowning in a well? You know, the only other suicide by drowning that comes to mind mm-hmm. or death by drowning that comes to mind is Sri Devi's. And oh, we, all know, we all know all the conspiracy surrounding yeah. around, the, around yeah. that one. So hmm. this also makes me, you know, just the spidey senses go, yeah. um, something's off. awry. Hmm. But make no mistake, you and I aren't the only ones who found this ruling and everyone's reaction to be completely absurd. In a show of solidarity to Sister Abhya, 67 nuns belonging to her congregation spoke up. They weren't going to take the blatant disregard for facts and denial of justice lying down. These protests, organized and led by a 23-year-old human rights activist, Jamon P, were the reason there was finally movement in this case. You see, Jamon and the nuns who supported his cause knew one thing for sure, that the service of God was a beautiful thing, but that the clergy in Kerala was needlessly powerful and corrupt and knew the truth behind Abhya's murder, but was hell-bent on hiding it from the world. They knew that the story of this bright and devoted young nun dropping a slipper, leaving an axe, leaving the fridge door open and spilling a water bottle, all to scratch her neck and jump into a well to kill herself, was a lie. These nuns, along with Jamon, formed the Abhya Action Council in the same month as Abhya's death and petitioned the Chief Minister of Kerala, urging him to look at the facts again and investigate this case for what it truly was, a murder. It was these protests that finally led to the CBI stepping in and putting some of its best officers on Abhya's case. Yet, 13 different batches of CBI officers would come into office and those 13 CBI officers would leave office over 15 years, unable to solve this case. Was it a murder or was it a suicide? That was the question they could not answer. Or maybe they could answer it. It was just an answer they didn't want the world to know. Ashwara, were these CBI investigators that were involved Mm -hmm. leaving because they were transferred or because the case was just so complicated that by the virtue of time passing, new CBI investigators came and went? The former, and there are countless such Mm. stories, one of which we're just going to get into. When the CBI first began its investigation in the year 1993, the officer put on the case was Deputy Superintendent Varghese P. Thomas. He filed the first report for the case and even came forward to say that he believed that the evidence pointed to the death being a murder. His belief that this was clearly a murder is heavily recorded in case diaries that he kept during his investigation. But Aryan, once this deputy's stance on this case, the stance being that he believed this to be a murder, murder, became known within the CBI department, he was so quickly transferred to a department of the CBI in a completely different state. And right after that... don't tell me he took a voluntary retirement. He took voluntary retirement with almost a decade worth of service still left. So it was a move that made no sense to anybody. But we all know what this means. After Superintendent Varghese was moved from his post, the new appointed officer took it upon himself to conduct a dummy test with a life-size doll dummy of Sister Abhya's body in 1995. This dummy of her was dropped into the well she was found in from different angles to try and draw reliable conclusions. But ultimately, the department returned empty-handed. No conclusions. This further agitated the Action Council that had been fighting for Abhya's justice from the very beginning, and their protests prompted the CBI to go out to the public and ask for help. They promised monetary compensation of Rs 3 lakhs, or 16 lakhs in today's money, for anyone who had information in the case, but yet again returned empty-handed. No conclusions. By 1996, three years after the night of the death, the CBI was asked to submit a report on their investigation. And a report was submitted. The conclusion of the report? The CBI was unable to determine whether the death was a suicide or a murder due to a lack of medical evidence. 
The courts, however, saw what the rest of the public was seeing and refused to accept this report. But isn't this report like a step in the right direction because it goes from it was definitely a suicide to we can't ascertain whether it was a suicide or a murder? So, Aran, I think this is at the heart of why the court rejected this argument on part of the CBI. When the court was getting these documents from the CBI, which was the CBI's investigation over the last how many ever years, the court could see there was evidence in here that needed to be pursued more. And this is something mm. that comes up again in this case later, where the courts ridiculed the CBI heavily and criticized them for there being clear evidence that needed to be pursued, mm. but that the CBI was doing nothing about. And I think that's what the court's motive was, to say, no, take this back, go do this again. We need better answers than we don't know what's going on okay. here. Like I said, though, the courts saw what the rest of the public was seeing and refused to accept this report. The courts wanted more answers. The pressure from the Kerala High Court and the protesting members of the congregation were mounting on the CBI. The CBI came back with a second report in 1999, officially calling the case a homicide for the very first time since the death, but claiming that there was not enough evidence to determine the identity of the killer. The court, again, refused to accept this report. Then again, in the year 2005, more than a decade after Sister Abhya's death, the CBI produced a report. This time with the same verdict as its first one. No indication of foul play. Surprise, surprise, the court again rejected the report. After all of this, Aryan, the courts came out with a very strong statement against the CBI. Against the CBI? Against the CBI. Is that yeah. common? I, not that, not I've, that heard I've heard of. of yeah. Any of the cases we have covered, I have no idea. But they did in this case. They accused the CBI of having vested interests towards a specific party and compromising the investigation by defeating the ends of justice. Mm, wow. Anyway, after all of this, after so many angry protesters, after an agitated court, after the Action Council fighting to fight for justice, mm -hmm. after a PIL filed with the High Court of Kerala, there was one revelation made by the CBI that completely rocked the core of the country and especially the state. That was? The CBI had suspects. All along? All along. Wow. They had suspects all of these years. And these suspects came to the CBI via the story of a thief. Over the course of the many years that the CBI had engaged in this investigation, not one, not two, but three suspects had come to light because of the tale of a man named Raju. Prosecution witness number three, Adaka Raju. The night of the murder, Raju had theft on his mind. His plan was simple, to sneak up onto the terrace of the hostel home to the nuns, the same hostel where Sister Abhya was sleeping on the night of March 27th, and steal some of the many copper rods that are usually found inside the lightning arrester on top of the building. And he did exactly that. He got up on the terrace and as he searched for the copper rods and collected them to try and bring them down the building in the wee hours of the night, he saw something really, really weird going on down at the entrance of the hostel building. He saw a man arrive. I just want to make sure we are here relying on the testimony mm -hmm. of a thief mm -hmm. who happened to be there mm -hmm. the same day that Abhya got murdered. This is engaging in theft, yes. Engaging in theft Very actively. Much so. There is a reason you will fall completely in love with Raju and so will the courts and you'll come and see In love with the thief. In love with this thief. Who was there thieving, thieving on the day of her murder. That's very hard for me murder. to believe. Just wait and watch. Now, if a man arriving at a building in the depths of the night isn't weird to you, that's because you're not a nun living in a women's only convent hostel as part of a faith that would heavily frown upon the presence of a man in such a private space, especially at this hour. And Raju knew this reality, which is why this image of this man stuck in his mind. That wasn't the only reason he remembered this sight though. Raju actually knew who the man walking in was. It was a priest, Father Thomas Kutur. Trying to get this image out of his mind, Raju knew firstly that he himself was in the middle of a crime and couldn't stand there thinking about Father Thomas. And secondly, he knew he could never tell anyone about what he saw because of what he was doing up there. So Raju climbed down the building with the copper rods and sold them to a local scrap dealer named Shamir the next day. 
Eventually, upon reading the news of Sister Abhya's death and seeing the police botch the investigation and call it a suicide, Raju knew he had information that probably could be of use. In probably one of the most heartwarming moments of honesty in this entire case, Raju goes to the police within the first week of the murder, confesses of his theft and narrates to them what and who he saw inside the hostel that night. All right, I changed my mind. Do we love Raju or do we love right, Raju? Do we want to give him a hug? He might be lying, okay, but he for might now, be. You'll for now, see though. You'll I see. My mind. You'll see. Good guy. In turn, in what is one of the most brutal and heartbreaking moments of dishonesty in this case, the police accuses Raju of being Abhya's murderer, arrests not only him but also Shamir, the scrap dealer Raju sold the rods to, and Shamir's brother. For the next almost 60 days, the police kept Raju, Shamir and Shamir's brother in custody where all three of them were brutally tortured. Raju was tortured to get him to confess of committing the murder and Shamir and his brother were tortured so that they would rat Raju out. But none of the three men budged. They were offered money and a house and funds to educate their children, but the men did not budge. They were innocent and they stood by their story and were eventually released. You know what all of this means, Aryan? Mm. It means that from week one of this murder, the police had a lead in the form of Father Thomas. Correct. A lead they did nothing about. A lead that they never went on to investigate. I mean, let me prod the elephant in the room. Yeah. Something everybody would be wondering. What was Father Thomas doing in the women's hostel at 4M? Who was he there to meet consensually or non-consensually? That, Aryan, is perhaps the most important question of this case right now. Mm. In the answer to the question, why was Father Thomas at the hospital at that hour on that day, lies the motive of Sister Abhya's death. In the answer to the question, who was he there to meet, perhaps, maybe, lie some other suspects. The interesting part, though, Aryan, is that the police knew the answer to these two questions. And they knew the answer to these two questions because Father Thomas himself couldn't stop talking about the answer to these two questions. In passing conversations with friends and acquaintances, Father Thomas had managed to let a huge secret slip. The secret of his affair to Sister Sefi, a nun living in the same convent hostel as Sister Abhya. Quote, me and her are like husband and wife, Father Thomas had told a prominent activist in a conversation shortly before the murder. Upon further investigation, it was found that the cook who worked at the hostel had come forward long ago to tell the police that Father Thomas was a regular at the hostel. But not only was he a regular, there was another priest who was a regular, Father Jose. The two men would often frequent the hostel to meet Sister Sefi, and every time they did, they would get the cook to make the three lavish meals, which they enjoyed together, without any of the other convent nuns. In fact, the two men had visited just the day before Abhya was found dead. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Bring it my way. Yeah, yeah. I'm ready. <laughs> okay, so in some regards, a nun's hostel is similar to a college hostel because, you know, these are the kinds of things that happen, in, you know, men entering, you know, male students entering the women's campus. So, mm -hmm. you know, our... Minus the lavish meals, I'm gonna or say... Or the murders, although hostels are known for murder. I'm just saying that to my initial the point... The insane need to keep this a secret, yeah, barring all of those points. Yeah, there is a small barring similarity. Barring the need for murder. Okay, let's yeah, get back to the case. Aran, moving away from your hostel comparison, there is an incredibly important detail here, which is that the convent had dogs. Dogs that were known to ferociously guard the building hmm. and technically should have barked all night had the killers of Sister Abhya been strangers. But they weren't. That was the night the dogs remained completely silent. It's like when uh, in a you know there's homicide in a house and there's no signs of break-in. The police exactly. goes that yep. it was probably an inside job. Absolutely. The dogs are de facto. Yeah. There is no um, exactly. Marks They're the almost front. like yeah. exactly the marks of someone struggling to enter inside. Mm. And the dogs didn't bark. That's because the dogs knew the murderer. That's because Sister Abhya knew her murderers. That's because the murderers belong to her very own congregation. 
And make no mistake, the CBI didn't think one of them committed this murder. They thought all three of them committed this murder. Which is why, in 2007, on the demand of the Kerala High Court, the CBI was made to conduct a narco test on all three of them. In the results of this narco test, which were eventually presented to the court, the three don't look terribly guilty at all. They look dazed and out of it, but not guilty. Only, it's later revealed that the footage of the narco test presented to the court had more than 30 different points at which it had been edited and doctored. The original tapes were later uncovered by a news channel, and in those tapes, the three can be heard loud and clear, admitting to the killing of Sister Rabia that night. <laughs> And added to all of this was perhaps the most jaw-dropping and scandalous piece of evidence that remained hidden for so long. Record of a hymenoplasty, or more simply, a surgical reconstruction of the hymen. Over the course of its investigation, the CBI had come across documents revealing that Sister Sefi, one of the prime suspects in this case, had undergone a hymen reconstruction the day after Sister Abhya's death from the church hospital to try and hide the fact that she was sexually active. Now, the reason the court ever found out about this surgery was because in 2008, when the pressure on the CBI mounted, it conducted a virginity test on Sister Sefi, which revealed the hymen reconstruction surgery. When the CBI initially conducted this test, the result was that Sister Sefi was not a virgin because the surgery conducted was apparent. However, these results of the virginity test were then tampered with using a whitener to indicate that she was, in fact, a virgin. This, again, was sign of an inside job of someone trying to protect Sister Sefi and the congregation. Consider this ignorant of me, but I had never personally come across a virginity test as a metric of evidence yeah. for, in any case, up, apart from when, you know, rape is involved. Um, and, you know, it, it's good it is trying to get to the bottom yeah. of what actually happened in this particular case. But this tool just sounds that it can be used in entirely sexist ways. I mean, it sounds so invasive incredibly to sexist, be allowed yeah. to test the virginity of a woman. It's incredibly sexist, Aryan. And I think the distinction is that even when a woman is raped, I don't think it's tested on whether or not a woman still has her hymen intact. Yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. think that's the test. The test is probably whether or not there are semen remains or like in her body. Or like damage on the uterine wall or Precisely. something. Precisely. Yeah. That's not what this is at all. And I think it's incredibly important to point out how sexist a virginity test actually is. They've been admissible in court and actually be able to be used as evidence for the longest time. Uh, a ton and of and hymen can break without Absolutely. sex. Absolutely. Right? Some, so many women are born with very little to almost no hymen lining. So many of them break it just by existing. Other women who engage in sports as young girls break their hymen that way. So it's completely untrue that, that there is some way to test or even for Sister Sefi to reverse her own yeah. hymen breakage. That's simply not true. Also, Aran, I think it's important to point out there is no biological definition to what a virgin is. There is only a social definition to what a virgin is. And yeah, again, just the idea that Sister Sefi's virginity could actually be tested or mm. she could reverse it on her own. Simply not true. Absolute nonsense. Don't buy into it. But I guess the point here is that the change in Sister Safi's virginity test reports, clearly indicating the report had been tampered with, combined with the evidence of her hymen reconstruction surgery just the day after the murder, really put her smack dab in the centre of this crime. She seemed guilty from all accounts. And she, Father Thomas and Father Jose seemed to have the perfect motive. That night, at 4 a.m., Sister Rabia woke up to study. While studying, she felt thirsty and decided to get herself some chilled water from the kitchen fridge. But the moment she walked into the kitchen, what she stumbled upon changed her whole life. Sister Sefi in a compromising position with Father Thomas and Father Jose. In the spur of the moment, panicked and frenzied, Sister Sefi picked up the small hand axe in the kitchen meant for chopping firewood and struck Sister Rabia after a struggle. 
The three then presumed her to be dead and carried her body to the well on the hostel compound and dropped her inside, leaving a trail of clues they never bothered to clean up, such as her two slippers in two completely different locations, her white veil stuck under the kitchen door, the murder weapon just lying on the floor, and the water bottle with spilt water on the floor. Aryan, I have a question here, and this question goes out to you, this question goes out to the audience. Please type your responses, your possible theories in the comments. The one thing about this case I don't fully understand is that godforsaken water bottle and the spilt water on the floor. If Sister Abhya walked into the kitchen on the three of them in a compromising position, mm. she had the time to go and get water, water and then spill that water once the struggle began. Was the water bottle placed there on purpose? Why wasn't it removed? What about the other pieces of evidence? Like, were they trying to send some kind of message by just letting the evidence be there? Make it look like an outside job? I don't know. The water bottle to me is integral and central to this. I don't know. I mean, I can imagine a scenario where Sister Abhya is groggy mm -hmm. and, you know, half asleep, she walks in, yeah. takes out the bottle. They're all, you know, acting silent in the background. Yeah. And it's when she takes out the bottle, she realizes, holy crap, something's up. Yeah. Um, but regarding them intentionally keeping the pieces of evidence out, we take for granted that normal people don't know how to commit crime. And... Mm -hmm it's very tough to be cold and calculated in a situation yeah. that you find yourself in. So I think it's more uh, callousness and complacency than cold-hearted, hmm. uh, you know, planning that allowed uh, the father and the sister to come up with this uh, sort of a charade. It's interesting. To me, it's more haphazard almost to try and clean up the evidence. It seems like if I was killing someone, my instinctual reaction is shit, like clean up the water, remove hmm. the water bottle, make these pieces disappear. But I guess I'm, yeah, well, that's why I'm not a murderer. If Aishwarya kills somebody, <laughs> we now know what to look for because we now know. For no what evidence. To look for. That's, yeah, no, that makes sense. But as the water bottle to me, I can also see a situation where this is just kind of that detail which gets reported weirdly mm -hmm. and gets transferred weirdly in news articles and whatnot. The Chinese whisper. Chinese whisper, evidence, yeah. exactly. Where she was in the kitchen, they were in the dining room across. She walked in to get water and then stumbled upon them. Like just something yeah. silly like that that kind of gets written weirdly, mm. I guess. But I think what is unbelievable about this saga is that the major details of it were known to the authorities right from the start. Yet they did nothing about it. Finally, in 2007 and 2008, after succumbing to pressure from the courts, all of these details I've told you came to light for the very first time. And by November of 2008, Sister Sefi, Father Thomas and Father Jose were all arrested for the murder. The trial began shortly after, which concluded an absolutely unbelievable 28 years after the murder in December of 2020. This in an instant became the longest investigation ever in the history of the state of Kerala. The court found Father Thomas and Sister Sefi guilty of the murder of Sister Abhya for destruction of evidence and for defamation and awarded them life in prison, but acquitted Father Jose for lack of evidence. In 2023, the court heard Sister Sefi's petition for the virginity test and in a historic move for the country, declared any and all forms of virginity tests to be unconstitutional, violations of the right to privacy and violations to the right to life. Today, both the murderers live the rest of their days in two separate prisons in Tiruvananthapuram where even murder couldn't help them unite. The case ended with the judge speaking highly of the one single witness in this case who did not change his story till the very end and displayed unflinching honesty. Adakka Raju, the key to solving this seemingly unsolvable crime. But this story doesn't end with justice for Sister Abhya. There were many, many more whose lives were destroyed in its process. The first CBI deputy to work on the case, Deputy Varghese, who was left with no choice but to either corrupt himself or quit. Or the first sub-inspector to work on this case, Inspector Augustine, who prepared the FIR for the murder, who killed himself in 2008 by slitting his wrists and taking poison, claiming torture by the CBI during the course of this case. Or scrap dealer Shamir and his brother, tortured in prison for the fault of being just in the wrong place at the wrong time or the community of Christians in Kerala, whose faith was left tarnished by the acts of cold-blooded murderers. There is a lot more justice that needs to be had in this case. 
Unfortunately, the story seldom ends with justice for the victim. It usually only begins. If you like what we do here at the AC Studios and absolutely love what we're wearing today, this is merch you can go buy all for yourself. You can buy this Desi Crime merch in our YouTube store on the link down below at Kadak Merch. Keep the engines at Desi Studios rolling so we can pay our videographer right behind the camera to make these amazing episodes just for you.